I want to welcome everybody here. Thank you for taking the time to sit through the class, for showing the interest in the class. Um, for those of you who do not know, my name is Jim Bollinger. I have a channel, Do Right Fabrication. I have a shop at the house at home on my farm. I'm a full-time firefighter paramedic for the City of Orlando Fire Department. My shop at home, I do a little bit of machining, a little bit of welding, actually a lot of welding. I teach for Lincoln. I started doing that many, many years ago. Uh, this is the class I teach a couple times a year. Uh, we usually will teach about 1,500 students the same class. We're fixing to enter the world of whiz-bang science. There are basically two types of current we can use to weld with, or that we have, period. One is DC, or direct current. The other is AC, or alternating current. A car battery, a watch battery, a battery in your iPad, iPhone, all of them are DC direct current. That means there is a positive and a negative and current flow will continue until the battery is depleted. It is a direct or constant flow of current. Its ugly brother is called AC or alternating current. In alternating current, the positive and negative reverse back and forth. The number of times a second the positive and negative switch back and forth is called the frequency. Because if you were to look at it on an oscilloscope, it is an actual frequency, and we're gonna get into that in a few minutes. Then DC polarity. See, there's a little negative next to the DC. That's DC electrode negative. It's, all, it's always refers in TIG welding to the electrode. 70% of the heat is in the plate. Do you see that? That means that our, our arc that we're creating, 70% of the heat is being driven into the plate. 30% is into the electrode. Now. Those of you that have pens and are taking notes, write this down. 6,280 degrees. At 6,280 degrees, tungsten melts, pure tungsten. I'm gonna tell you for the sake of easy math, trust me, don't try to look it up on Google because the decimal points are gonna mess you all up. The arc measured at the center is around 10,000 degrees. So if you have a 10,000 degree arc and 70% of the heat, how hot is the plate? 7,000 degrees right? 7,000 degrees. That same equation, let's flip it on the backside. This becomes very important in a minute. How hot is the electrode? 3,000 degrees. What temperature did I tell you that tungsten melted at? 6,280 degrees. So we don't melt our tungsten. If we went to our battery and we switched our terminals on our battery and we made the electrode positive, 70% of our heat is now in our electrode. What's 70% of 10,000 again? What temperature did I tell you the tungsten melted at? 6280. What happened to the tungsten? Bye -bye. That's why we always TIG weld when we're welding in DC, DC electrode negative. If you try to do it the other way, it melts off. Now, we always get the question, well, why do you even make the machine with DC electrode positive? Does anybody know? Man, somebody's smart. He said stick welding. Basic principle here is stick welding. We're gonna weld primarily with DC electrode positive and stick welding. It's a constant current machine. We tell it 90 amps. It's gonna give you, strike the arc is gonna give you 90 amps continuous. If you push, the, set the machine, the TIG welder to 90 amps and push the pedal to the floor, how many amps is it gonna give you? So it's gonna hold constant current. They're both constant current machines. A TIG welder and a stick welder are essentially the same thing with a TIG welder having a bunch more circuitry on the high end to start the arc and control our gas flow. If you have a DC stick welder at home, an old school DC stick welder, you can buy what's called a poor man's TIG torch. It goes into where your, your electrodes plug in the front, you hook a bottle of argon to it, and you scratch start it for DC. You could do that, and it works well. But you can't control your heat. Whatever you set the machine to is what you got, because that's part of the circuitry they have to add to it. You see that sine wave? That sine wave is what's called a sinusoidal AC sine wave. If we're here in the United States, we have 60 hertz. If you look on the back of anything that you plug into the wall, your toaster, your microwave, DVD player, if you plug it into the wall, it says 110 volts, 115 volts, 60 hertz. This in the United States is 1 60th of a second. This is one cycle, as you, if you were to look at it on an oscilloscope, okay? If we say that the up here is positive and down here is negative, this line in the middle means it's zero. It's not positive or it's not negative. This is extremely important for welding aluminum. Let's talk about aluminum for a minute. Let's call out, everybody call out, what do we like about the aluminum? It's lightweight, we got one. High thermal conductivity, co corrosion resistance. Let's talk about that for a minute. 
This is a piece of just plain uh, mild carbon steel. See that rust on it? That happened from my shop to here. Why did this not rust? It's not ferrous. He said it's not ferrous. That's correct. What else? That gentleman got it. It's aluminum oxide. Let's talk about that for a minute. Aluminum oxide. It's clear. It's almost, we'll call it waterproof. Okay, gas, almost gas proof. Hard and it self heals. And it has a much higher melting temperature than aluminum. So, if we take this piece of aluminum and we were to take a grinder, we are to grind across it, we would grind off all the aluminum oxide that forms on it, right? That is a correct statement, right? Almost instantaneously in our atmosphere, aluminum oxide forms back over the top of the aluminum, which keeps it from corroding. But yes, corrosion is a form of rust. So it's self-healing. That's why we like them for like our boat tops, and, and well, we have a lot of that in Florida, boat tops, lawn furniture, because if you drag it across the concrete and scratch off the aluminum oxide, it begins to heal almost immediately behind itself. It's like your own can of Krylon, right? Then you have to paint it. That aluminum oxide layer, it, it melts at about 3,600 degrees. You can write that down if you want to. This aluminum melts at around 1,200. Trust me, it makes the math easier, okay? I'm using round numbers. So about three times hotter to melt the aluminum oxide that forms on the surface. How do we get the oxide layer off the aluminum and weld it? The positive half of the cycle. He is correct, we use AC. This again, I try to make things simple in my mind because it's a dark, scary place. When the sine wave starts to come up, think of it like a fist punching up. If you've ever welded aluminum, you can visibly, visibly see the oxide layer pop off. You can see it start popping off. It's punching through that oxide layer and it all comes off. This is our maximum output. This is where we do all our heat. What's interesting to point out here is notice that it's very, very lazy. See that sine wave? We're only at peak output for a very, very short amount of time. Then it begins to fall. When it gets to this line right here, guess what's happening? He is correct, nothing. We're at zero volts, zero current, zero everything. But then we go, our electrode's now negative. So where's all our heat? It's in the material. Remember, DC electrode negative, 70% of the heat's in the plate. We're, we're doing all our work down here now. So 50% of the time in a balanced sinusoidal AC sine wave, 50% of the time the electrode is positive and 50% of the time it's negative. What's 50% of 10,000? 5,000 degrees. So the tungsten is 5,000 degrees. What temperature does the tungsten melt at? 6,280 degrees. So we still don't melt our tungsten off even though half the time we're positive, our tungsten never gets to that, that 6,280. Now, who in here has heard of a square wave machine? Who's seen my Square Wave 200 video? That's a square wave machine. Everybody wants to know what a square wave is. Do you see how that sine wave right there looks square? Square-ish? So remember a minute ago I said that sine wave when it went up and down was at, a, at its peak output for, for a very brief amount of time. Look at this one, see how much, how much longer it's now at peak output? Can you guys see that? So you're getting more work done for every cycle. You're creating more heat. Now, that could be bad because we're putting more heat into the electrode, right? But we're also putting more heat into our plate. But we now have machines, if you saw my Square Wave 200 video, I talk about it. it's an asymmetric TIG machine, meaning that now with technology, we can take that sine wave and we can manipulate it. We don't have to be positive as much as we're negative because all we need is that sine wave to punch the oxide layer off. We can now take and shift some of that time down in the negative side. Look at the second one down. You see how that one's more positive? We're more, times, more time positive there? That means we're doing more cleaning. Look at the bottom one, we're now more negative. You see that, right? So now we're doing more work. Same machine, same output, but we're actually welding more metal. We call it unbalanced. It's not a balanced sine wave. I'm, on my machines, I run about 75% unbalanced, which means about 75% of my weld arc is negative, and about 25% positive. What are the circumstances where I would want more cleaning? If you had a dirty piece, real dirty, heavily corroded piece of material, like something that was around salt air, and you just couldn't seem to get it all out of there, you can switch it and spend more time in the positive to get more cleaning action. Most of the time, we can mechanically remove 
all of the contamination, the oxides. 25 to 30 percent cleaning action is most of the time more than adequate, unless it's he heavily contaminated. Look at this sine wave again, this one here. Remember we said we're positive up here, when we get to the middle line, we're where? Zero. To make electricity flow through argon, think of a fluorescent light tube. If you're old enough to remember starters and electronic uh, fluorescent light tubes, does anybody remember those things? They look like a little blinker you had to put them in, right? What that starter did is it ionizes the gas inside the tube to allow electricity to flow through it. Once it becomes ionized, it becomes a conductor and electricity will jump from the tungsten to the plate and you'll have an arc. So how do we ionize that gas cloud? We've got a couple of ways. He said high frequency. We're going to talk about high frequency here in just a minute. But some of the simpler machines, you have to do what's called scratch start or lift start, where you actually touch the tungsten, you're creating a short circuit, and then you lift it, and that creates a spark. That's all it needs is that spark, and it ionizes the gas cloud, and the arc will continue to flow. Most of the more advanced machines have what's called high frequency. Think of high frequency like a spark plug. It jumps a spark when you step on the pedal, it sparks at one time, ionizes the gas cloud, boom, there you go. If any of you have the switch on there that says high frequency, off, on, or continuous. The reason I tell you this is a lot of you guys are gonna go practice on machines that you, you know, borrow or go into somebody's shop till you get comfortable with it. If you don't know this, you will pick the machine up and throw it in the dumpster on your way out of there because it will drive you bananas. If you're welding in AC, it has to be on continuous. If you have it on start only, and you step on the pedal, you'll get one flash of light because the sine wave goes up, you get the one flash of light. As soon as it hits zero, there's no more current flow. The gas cloud deionizes. Then it cannot carry electricity through it anymore. So on, on the older machines where it says continuous, the high frequency is superimposed against the weld arc and it keeps the gas cloud ionized all the time. And start only is for DC because DC is a continuous flow of current. So once the arc jumps one time and ionizes the gas cloud, we don't ever cross through zero until we let up off the pedal. So the gas cloud stays ionized the whole time, therefore we don't need high frequency but one time. Just like the lift in DC where we lift started. Some people ask, why is there an off? What did I teach you about stick welders and TIG welders? You don't need high frequency when you're stick welding, so you turn it off. In the old machines, there's a high frequency um, set of points in there. They actually break, start and break the gap. Realize that that is true radio frequency. It broadcasts. If you get home and your neighbor says, every time you TIG weld, I can't watch TV, let me tell you how to fix that really simple. If you can get to the outside of your building and you can drive a ground rod outside your building, you can just run a very, it does not have to be a big wire. It's not carrying current, it's carrying frequency. Go from the ground just to any metal screw on the case of the machine. All the high frequency will go to ground. High frequency runs over the surface of everything. The new machines use something called capacitance discharge. It's not generated through a radio frequency producing device. That's the best way I can explain that one. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed what you saw here today. Be sure to subscribe to my channel and like us on Facebook. 